Hey there, Droya here, and welcome to this tutorial where we shall go through the startup and flying process of the DHC6 Twin Otter from Aerosoft in Microsoft Flight Simulator. In this video, we'll go through the basics on how to fly the aeroplane, as well as an abridged process on setting up the cockpit from cold and dark to ready to fly states, meaning we will skip a few detailed parts of the checklist such as testing the alarms for example, but as you get to grips with the aeroplane, it's something that you'll definitely be able to gain knowledge on in the future. Do also be aware that in regards to setting up a flight plan, I highly recommend you have a sim brief plan ready to go. Likewise, feel free to follow along with this flight as we take to the skies in our Isle of City sky bus from Land's End to St Mary's. Without any further delay, let's get the Setcraft flying, shall we? There are three main places I'll be referring to when going through the aircraft startup process. These are the upper overhead panel, which includes your lighting and anti icing. The lower overhead panel, one on the capsule side, which includes your electrical systems and lights, also your engine starter, and the lower overhead first officer side, which includes your windshield wipers and your window heat. And finally, there's then your centre pedestal, which includes all of your gauges, your fuel pump boosts, and also your GNS330 GPS system, which during the tutorial we'll also go through in detail in terms of how to set it up. One more design feature you'll find from the Havilland Canada is that the throttle, flaps and fuel systems are on the roof of the aircraft as opposed to on the lower pedestal. This is essentially done to simplify the cable linkage of the aircraft, so instead of having your cables and fuel switches route through the floor of the aeroplane and up the sides, it makes it much easier to put it through the roof and then go straight to the wings, both making it cheaper and easier to maintain, especially when flying through rugged terrain. Also, it provides better protection as the increased risk of damaging the floor of the aeroplane is minimised by having it all go through the roof. So when you can see your thrust on flaps, look up, not down. The first thing you want to do is unlock your flight controls, and this is quite simply done by clicking on the little lock on the floor of the aircraft turret. Your head lock be removed, you now have full control of the aircraft steering column in the centre. Another thing you'll notice with the tunnel up is that the yokes and steering column is actually a single unit in the middle with the wheels, the yokes themselves, actually kind of struts off a bit to the side. Again, another design thing you'll find in the tunnel but actually works quite well in regards to, again, simplifying controls and also giving the pilot more leg room in terms of actually being able to maintain the aircraft control with the system in the centre. What we now to do is head to the upper over the panel and just make sure that your throttle is at the idle position, your prop is light to so the minimum position and your fuel flow is cut off. You don't want any early ignition in the engines here, so make sure everything's set to its minimum, it's all cut off and there'll be no interference with the overhead panel. What we're going to do now is head over to the lower captain's side overhead and set the external to battery and the DC master to on. This will now turn on the electrical systems of the aircraft and put everything into its self-test mode. So you'll see all your lights come online, your gauges come online, you can set the transponder to the off position so you can see your support code visible. And once your self-test mode is finished, what you want to do is go to the upper overhead panel and set your lighting and icing as required. So we're going to set the anti-collision lights to on the no smoking lights to on and seatbelt sign also to on. The position lights will turn on later on when I'm going through the engine startup process and then the flight comps light essentially is the red light in the cockpit. So when flying through low visibility on night conditions to show you the red light in the cockpit it makes everything more visible to you but since we're in currently with clear conditions in the day we'll turn that light off for now. Head over to your de-iso boosts, set the de-iso boost to auto and from slow to fast. This essentially just quickens the process of the aircraft anti-icing and especially when flying through really poor conditions essentially just allows you to speed up the process of actually melting all the ice and makes the aircraft flying safely again. While we're here we're just going to set the pitot heat to on and essentially just force the pitot tubes and allows for accurate speed indication from the tubes out front of the aircraft. At this stage, you'd now want to go through all of your aircraft's like alarms checks, your systems checks, so for example the fire alarm check in the middle, press the test switch. You'd hear the alarm sound, 
and says you'll do that for your aircraft. But again, as this is an abridged tutorial, I'm not going to go through the in-depth of the aircraft, this is just the basics of getting it flying. So we'll skip that for now. And what we're going to do is set up our GPS and CDI. So the Twin Otter makes use of the Garmin GS530 system, which does take a little bit of learning in regards to actually controlling the menu, but in itself is not a difficult process. So what I'm going to do is use my flight plan from Lands and St Mary's. If you have your own flight plan, then feel free to use that. If you don't, then feel free to follow along with this one. What you want to do is click on the flight plan button, to initiate your flight plan, and click on the push cursor, so your cursor to appear. To hold the cursor up and down, we use the big scroll wheel at the back. At the moment, there's no waypoints inserted, we'll just do it on the first location. And to actually start typing your waypoints, we use the smaller scroll wheel to scroll through all the letters and numbers. So first of all, we're going to start with the departure airport, in this case it's Echo Golf Hotel Charlie. So we scroll to E, use the big cursor, scroll to the next position, search for a G, then a H, and then a C. There you go, send just lands end, that's our correct position. Once you're happy, click on enter to accept. Big scroll wheel, moving to the second position. We can search our first waypoint, which is Kogok. So once again, small scroll wheel, search for a K, and a no. Then a G. And one thing you will notice is that eventually the system will actually start skipping letters. Because it has got the entire worldwide database of waypoints, airways, and airports installed, if it knows, for example, that there's not a F in this configuration, they'll skip the F and go to the next letter to G. So you can already see I've typed in K-O-G-O, -O, and it's already found a co waypoint early, with the location in Europe, Great Britain. So this is essentially your first two letters of your archive codes. So in this case, Echo Golf Hotel Charlie, E-G-H-C, E-G, Europe, Great Britain, and then you enter that, these are your next waypoints. And then from co we have one more waypoint, which is Lanlo. So he already skips a lot of waypoints there, or a lot of leads there to get to L. Then an engine A. Then an N. Then an L. And an L. Cool. And those sets. And final waypoint, which are arrival airports of Echo Golf Hotel Echo. So Echo Golf Hotel Whoops. So make sure you're also changing the position and change letters. Echo, there you go. St. Mary's, City Isles, that's our destination set. You now click on the flight plan button again, and you'll now see your flight plan added to your map. Back in the flight plan page, what we can do is click on the menu button, and what you can do is have your approaches and your arrivals. So again, using the small wheel to scroll between the options, our departure chart is in runway 16 today, so we'll click on enter, and if your airport has any departures in place, in this case the answer is no does not, then we'll skip that and carry on the process. Here we are on a Tornata at Kathmandu awaiting flights to Lukla for example. As you can see we have a departure on runway 02 on the set Igris 1 Bravo departure. So loaded before we go over to flight plan, go over to menu and what we're going to do is set our departure using the small scroll wheel we're going to set our SID, which is the Igorous One Bravo. And so that's transition. We have transition, nothing set, but we can use Igorous if this is available. In this case, we've got Ale, Kimti, or Lalba. Kimti actually been available for us, so we have to scroll down to Kimti and enter that. The active runway in use, currently runway 0 to a set. So you're happy, just click on Enter. And this will add the required waypoints to your flight. So you now see departing from Kathmandu, make a left hand turn and follow Sid 
my way out to the Kim T waypoints. And so once you've got your flight plan set up, the last thing you need to do is click on CDI button and switch over from the localizer to CDI. And this then brings your aircraft onto GPS mode and essentially allows you to fly from waypoint to waypoint rather than having to manually set your nav frequency or manual heading throughout your flight. With your GNS530 set, you are now ready for engine startup. Set the two fuel pump boosts to the on position. What we're going to do is start the right hand engine first, wait for that to stabilize, and then start the left hand engine. So, what we're going to do is head to the overhead panel and set the props to the minimal position. Also increase the throttle by a tiny little bit, about 5-10%. Make sure you have got some throttle going. It allows you to start up the engine with a little bit of extra fuel flow and power output. And just makes the startup process a little bit easier for the engines to run. With your throttles and prop sets, what we're going to do is now start the right hand engine by going to the lower overhead. And pressing the right engine startup. So go to the start switch, click to the right, and then heading to your center console, and your gas gen to hit about 12. As soon as you've got that, we'll then head over to the fuel cut off at the top, and just move the fuel into the open position. The number two engine should now start up. As soon as that started, go back to the lower overhead, move the starter selector into the left position. Watch the gas gen to about 12%, so your gas gen is essentially your N2 for the engine startup. Once that hits 12 as well, back to the overhead and move the fuel switch into the open position. Wait for that to start to stabilise. Once it does, just push the throttle so that both gas gens hit about 70. Let that sit for a few moments. Let your engines warm up. And once you have that your engines both active and stable, what you can do is lower the throttle back into the other position. Back to overhead, you can now move both prop levers into their full position as during the engine and takeoff run, what you want is maximum output with your throttles. Once you've done this, you'll also hear the much deeper engine noise that you'll get in your twin LTAR, the more classic sound as such of your aircraft. And with that, you'll be happy to know that your engine starts up, you're running stable and your aircraft is good to go. Head back to the upper overhead panel, set your generators into the on position, lower your flaps to about 10 degrees which will be your takeoff flaps, and make sure that the rest of your anti-icing is required is set, so for example prop the ice, anti -in intake anti-ice, and extend intake if required. And essentially make sure that depending on the weather conditions outside, your anti-icing is set up accordingly for what you need. So again, windshield icing, make sure that the windshield icing heater is set. And with that, you are almost ready to go. At this point, you are now ready to taxi. So what you're going to do is go to your upper overhead panel, set your position lights to on and taxi lights to on. Head back to your cockpits, turn off the parking brake, and the twin otter is one of the few aircraft where actually allows to use the reverse thrust to move out of stand. So if you want to, you can use the pushback target to move you out of the position, or alternatively, you can use your reverse thrusts 
to give the aircraft a little bit of momentum as the sand. And turn it on the taxiway yourself. And once you're in position, you're now free to taxi to your active runway. In this case, we're passing on runway 16 out of Land's End. So we'll increase the throttle slightly. And now the aircraft is to taxi on its own roll. Here we are, now short of runway 16 at Land's End. What we're going to do is use the lower overheads, turn on your landing lights, taxi into position, and as soon as you're ready, you're pretty much in position, just increase throttle and get yourself going. So let's enter the runway, we're going to make a right hand turn. See in the one six. Backtrack if required, but a lot of international airports, so it's not to operate, for the most part, this isn't required. So, Glasgow, for example, an airport where you do need to backtrack or taxi to the very end of the runway, the Twin Otter, you can pretty much use just a fifth of that runway to get yourself airborne. If required, do backtrack. If not required, then taxi in position and hold a few takeoff to test run. If you are flying on online networks such as IBAN VATSIM, now would be a good time to make sure that your transponder sets an active. So it sets the little transponder box over here to the altitude position. You're ready for takeoff, just hold your position. Keep holding the brakes. Increase your throttle about midway and watch the gas gen increase. When you're happy that both engines are stable, release the brakes and increase your throttle to maximum position. The pneumatic pressure lights will disappear. Push your nose down ever so slightly, stop rotating too early. And when your SV hits about 80, gently release the nose and pull back with the yoke. Just your trim is required. And try and pitch for about 1,200 feet per minute to climb at this stage. So 120 knots, you can then raise your flaps. And just keep flying runway heading until you're comfortable that the aircraft is flying stable. Cruising altitude flight will be about 8,000 feet. So I'm going to set my altitude to 8,000. So 
turn on your autopilot and increase the vertical speed to about 1,200 feet per minute. And then turn on your nav mode. The aircraft will change heading to bring itself on course and continue to climb until you hit your 8,000 feet. Now do note the altitude setup can be a little bit fiddly when you're to not start and you may find yourself pressing the button in the wrong order or the altitude may reset and you need to manually set it up again. Be slow with it. Don't overcomplicate things. Just be slow. Set an altitude. Turn on your autopilot. Increase the vertical speed. And then nav. Make sure you're climbing before you start flying course. As you can see, the aircraft has adjusted its position to intercept our flight plan and set. And as soon as it hits that magenta line, we'll start a left hand turn to continue us on the course that we should be flying. Now a good thing with this flight, Lands End St Mary's as a training flight, is that the entire duration of it is only about 10 minutes. It's not a very long way away. You're flying over water the majority of the flight, so in terms of hitting anything, the chance of that is pretty much zero. I mean, fair enough, if you're feeling daring, then uh, throw look yourself into Lukla in your very first flight. But with Lands End and St Mary's, you get a feel of both short runway operations and some relatively rugged terrain, because the airport St Mary's is situated on the side of a hill, especially where you do touch down, so it gives you enough practice to actually learn how to land on non flat runways while controlling something as small and rugged as your twin otter. As we approach our altitude, in this case 8,000 feet, you'll hear an audible alarm beep at you, and also an altitude alert light will appear on your console. At this point, you're just watching your altitude to wait until you hit 8,000 feet, and the aircraft should, if done correctly, level off automatically. What you're going to want to do when you hit your cruising altitude is go to your overhead panel and just feather the engines. What this does is it slightly changes the angle of the blades on the propellers to give you a slightly different rate of airflow around your wings and also ever slightly changes your thrust output to give you a slightly slower cruise but in return for more efficient flights. So this is the same as flying a uh, Mach 0.79 in a commercial jetliner opposed to Mach 0.82 which is maximum speed. All you're doing is relieving some pressure off the engines so you're not overpowering the aircraft but still with enough power output to keep the aircraft flying and steady. So now approaching 8,000 feet, we're going to reduce the throttle slightly and feather the engines just a tiny bit to maintain a steady rate of cruise. So you can see we're still cruising at about 150 knots, still maintaining a steady speed, but we're not overpowering the engine to the point where they do start to wear out, which in turn increases the maintenance cost of the aircraft.
In regards to setting up your approach, this can also be done on the GNS530 GPS system. So what you can do is go back to your flight plan page, click on menu, and then scroll down to select approach. Not arrival, approach. It's in this page here that you set up your approach runway and any transition points you may have on the way. So on occasion we are going to be flying into runway 27 as the active. If you select the scroll wheel, you'll be able to see any different runways now. So for example, we have 27032 at Lands and St Mary's. We're going to be using 27, so enter that transition. We either have Lands End or Tietanga Mike. We'll be using the Lands End transition, so enter that. Load it into your aircrafts. What this will do is now change your route so that you may come in on your pressure you've selected. So, aircraft is about to land low. Then, from land low, we have to Fox Run 27, which will start our NDB approach from runway 27. If you do, however, find yourself at an airport of an active ILS and localizer, such as this twin otter coming into Glasgow from Barra, then this isn't too difficult to set up either. What you need to do is head over to your digital radio panel, click on the push CV button to change from the comm section to the relocalizer section, and set the frequency for the runway you're flying into. So at Glasgow Runway 23, the ILS frequency is 110.1. So using the two wheels, set one one zero one one. Click on little V, switch it to the active frequency. Click on the CDI button to switch over to V localizer, and then using the little green dial here on the heading indicator, set that to the runway course. In this case, it's two two eight degrees. And now, as soon as your aircraft approaches the localizer position, what you've got to do is activate the approach mode like you're on a jetliner on the autopilot GPS, and the aircraft should then turn towards the runway heading and follow you down the path of the runway. This is especially useful at more modern and better facilitated airports, which has this system in place, but again, in Twinsar, just be aware that this may not always be the case, and not every airport you'll fly to will have these available. When ready, start your descent. All you've got to do is set your altitude to your minimum. So in this case, our minimum for the runway 27 will be 1,500. So set your altitude to 1,500 or your local airport's altitude to intercept glide slope. Click on the altitude button and set your vertical speed to start your descent. In this case, we'll set it at a rate of 1,600 feet per minute. What I'm going to do is lower our throttle, not idle, but just lower the throttle to the point where we're making a steady approach into the runway while descending, but again, not risking any opportunity to slow the aircraft out. It's a very rugged aircraft to not up, and it can be very hands on to fly. So it does take a bit of practice in terms of when you start your ascent, when you start your approaches, kind of learn to figure out when and how to fly the aeroplane, but when done correctly, this aircraft really is a pleasure to fly. It feels very good to stick on the controls. And flying to Lukla on the stream earlier on, you can really feel just how rugged this airplane can push for. So set your altitude to your required altitude. Set your descent rate, in my case 1,600 feet per minute. And know your throttle to the aircraft running at a steady rate of descent. At this point, we're now approaching the 1,500 feet we've set on the altitude indicator. The airplane will give us our audible and visual warning to let this is the case. And in terms of the visual, you can see the airport on the island of St. Mary and white flashing lights is guiding the aircraft towards it. Feel free to use GPS to get yourself a bit more familiar with the area and see the aircraft makes a right hand turn at the function of 27 will find straight into the runway, which is pretty simple. 
Oh, two seven, St. Mary's, one way through two has a little more of a challenge and sometimes it's fun approach and heading. What the aircraft four do is it will level off at 1,500. And at this point, you want to get yourself more comfortable with the approach. The Twin Otter doesn't have any Autoland or any major glide slope facility on board, so you are having to send this aircraft manually regardless. So what you want to do is level off at the altitude you've set. Let the aircraft make the final turn it requires. And start lowering the flaps to help you for slow down. I find that around the flaps 30 40 final approach at around 80 knots is generally sufficient for a smooth touchdown at most airports you're flying into. So if low flaps down to 10 degrees, you're going to increase throttle to keep the aircraft steady at around 100 knots. At this point, we now have a visual of the runway. The aircraft did dip slightly below its altitude, so what I have done is I've increased the rate of climb to about 100 feet per minute. Again, nice and steady, nothing too major, but the aircraft will be able to handle. Slow flaps down to 20 degrees. Yeah, just small adjustments on the throttle to keep the aircraft running steady and level. The more you fly to an OTA, so you get more of a feel of how the aircraft operates and flies. Once you're happy, you can turn off the autopilot by pressing the AP button. At this point, you're now flying manually. Short final. Set your landing flaps. In this case, we're using flaps 30 degrees. Set your minimum approach speed. In this case, we're going to slow down to about 80 knots. And using small, small adjustments of the yoke, keep the aircraft steady and flying stable to the runway. If you've got a bit of, bit of uh, crosswind, feel free to use your rudder to counter. If flying to look low, uh, don't look down. Okay, another benefit at Mary's uh, airport to practice flying at is that there's no kind of risk factor in regards to if you don't miss the approach, go around. To get more steady to the aeroplane, then feel free to try your hand at Look Clark. Because don't forget with Look Clark, there's no mistakes there. Once you're on final, you can't go around. You're landing no matter what. Make those small adjustments, keep the aircraft flying steady to the runway. Minimums continue. As you approach runway, just gently idle throttle. 15, 14, Start to flare. Make a touchdown. Let's activate your reverse thrusts. Just like that, you've made a successful landing at your destination airport. Again, it's a very twitchy aeroplane, the Twin Otter. It's in a field just right for landing, it does take a little bit of practice. What I'm now going to do is backtrack down runway 09 and head over to our parking stands.
once you're off the runway, what you can do is turn off your transponder by switching the dial to the off position. Turn off your landing lights on the low overhead captain side. And tags the aircraft to your standard choice. In this case here is at Mary's, right here in front of the terminal. Set your parking brakes. And to turn off your engines, what you've got to do is make sure that your throttle is in the idle position. And then cut the fuel flow by flicking the two red levers into the off position. And there you have it, your first successful flight in a DHC-6 Twin Otter. Again, it's not a very difficult aircraft to fly. The start-up and flying process isn't particularly drawn out or long. It does take a bit of practice, and of course, the more you repeat it, the better you'll get. And it's one of those airplanes that, once you start flying it, you will just fall in love with it, because it's such an easy airframe to fly. Doesn't matter which model you're in, if it's the DHC-300 or 100 version, or if you're using the skis, the flights, whatever, it's such a maneuverable aircraft, the Twin Otter will be certainly your top 5 top 10 favourites for you to fly in the long term. So uh, yeah, I hope this helps you with the basics on learning how to fly the aircraft. Feel free to watch it again, feel free to go through the process over and over to kind of cement your knowledge of the aeroplane. As always, it takes practice, the more you do it, the better you'll get. And I hope this tutorial certainly helps you with the very basics and educating the aeroplane flying. Otherwise, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, do leave a like, do subscribe if you already. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you many happy virtual hours in your Aerosoft Twitter. Take care, thank you for watching, and bye bye.